kids and youth are heading off. Fantastic. Wasn't that good? Isn't it good to profess and sing truth to God? As Claire said, it really does something to our hearts. And uh, as I said, this morning sees the start of Advent. And, uh, you know, Christmas is, what is it? It's 20, 27 days away. Don't want to panic anyone. But as, as Claire mentioned, Advent is traditionally a time of preparation, a time of hopeful anticipation. It's a time of waiting. It reminds us that while we, we live this side of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we are still awaiting his return, where he will make all things new and all waiting will finally be over. And over this last season, nearly two years now, we've been doing an awful lot of waiting, haven't we? Waiting for travel restrictions to lift or change, social distancing guidelines to change, mask wearing, no mask wearing, and, you know, waiting for more freedom. And it's still ongoing, isn't it? New variants, what does that mean? There's that sense of, of how long, O oh Lord? How long must we keep on waiting? But of course, so many of us have been waiting for things for years, years and years, waiting for change, waiting for loved ones to be saved, waiting for relationships to be healed, waiting for bodies to be healed, waiting for emotions and minds to be healed, waiting for that marriage partner, waiting for that job, waiting for breakthrough. And it can be really hard when we've been waiting a long time to keep holding on to hope. That's why it's so good to gather together and sing these truths that are unchanging regardless of our circumstances, that God is good and He alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. But it can be hard to hold on to hope. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. It, it can also mean weary. Hope deferred can make the heart weary. I think it's fair to say a lot of people are, are just weary in their hearts out in our community, in the church as well. A lot of people experiencing that, that just that heartache, that weariness. And in our passage this morning, as part of our Encountering Jesus series, we're going to be looking at two people who were in that place where their hearts were heavy. They were heartbroken. Their hopes had been dashed. It's Easter Sunday and yet they had witnessed their Messiah, the one they had pinned all their hopes on, be nailed to a cross. What was left now? What was going on? Their, their, their hope must have been misplaced. Their waiting must have been in vain until they encounter the risen Jesus Christ. And they are completely transformed. So I'd love us to look at this passage. You find it in Luke 24. If you've got your Bibles, please do turn to it or scroll to it on your phones. I want us to have a look through this encounter at some things that will help us wait with hope. Wait with hope. Let's pick up the story. Luke 24, we're going to read from verse 13. So it's Easter Sunday. Jesus has risen from the grave and slowly but surely, people are starting to hear about it. Now that same day, two of them were walking to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they discussed and talked about these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you're walking along? They kind of stood still, 
their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these last days? What things? Jesus asked. I love Jesus' sense of humor. What things? Tell me. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. You know, almost that. have you been living under a rock? I mean, you kind of had for a little while. But, but everyone would have been talk, talking about this event. This was not a minor event that had happened in Jerusalem. They would have been talking about these extraordinary things that Barabbas was, was let off. And instead, the crowd started cheering for Jesus to be crucified. What was going on? And then all this weird stuff happening, darkness covering the land, and and suddenly the temple curtain being torn from top to bottom. And now these these kind of confusing rumors that the tomb was empty. What on earth was going on? They couldn't make sense of it. And they expressed their heartbreak to their travel companion, to Jesus. Verse 21 We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had put our hope in him. Now look. First thing I want to draw out of this that will hopefully help us wait with hope is that we see Jesus pursuing the heartbroken and the disappointed As we've seen so many times, even in just this last preaching series, Encountering Jesus, he tends to go to those we would least expect him to go to. He goes to the outcasts. He goes to the ones where where people would have naturally overlooked. And as we see this first day of his resurrected life, does he go to the temple courts and go, I'm back? No. Does he go to the religious leaders and say, guys, you made a big mistake? No. He doesn't go to the Roman authorities. He doesn't go to Pilate and say, guess who's the real ruler here? No. He doesn't do any of that. He's only got 40 days before he ascends back into heaven. How is he going to maximize this precious time? Rather than going to the important and influential people, he instead walks alongside the ones and twos, those who are dejected, those who are broken in heart, those who've had their hopes dashed, those who are confused. Just speaks volumes of the heart of God. First person who encounters the risen Jesus Christ is is Mary Magdalene in the garden, tears streaming down her face. What a moment that must have been. And she is the one who is entrusted to be the very first messenger of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is risen, that he is alive. She wouldn't have even been allowed to be a witness in a court of law, Roman or Jewish, being a woman at that time. And yet Jesus says, you are my first witness. Go and tell the others. Jesus meets us in our pain, in our disappointment, and here again, We see him walking alongside these two unknowns. They're not even part of the inner circle. They're not part of the original 12. We don't even know one of their names. And they're heading off to this little town that doesn't even exist anymore. People aren't even sure where it is. All we know, it's kind of seven miles outside of Jerusalem. Nobody's walking to an insignificant town. And yet, on the first day of his resurrection, Jesus leaves Jerusalem and goes after them. Takes time. And these guys are in every sense of the word, walking in completely the wrong direction. Swallowed up by confusion and and disappointment. They're, They're leaving the very place where God will soon pour out his spirit. The very place where, as we've been singing, the spirit lit the spark and the church came alive. They were walking away from all of that, allowing their disappointment to take them off the path that actually God had called them to. And he comes alongside them. He comes alongside them. 
You know, how often when we're dealing with disappointment, do we tend to hide away? Not only were these guys walking away from from the place where the promised Holy Spirit was going to come, they were also walking away from fellowship with other believers who were staying in Jerusalem. How often do we shut ourselves away, just say to people, I'm not in a good place right now? The good news is, Jesus models exactly what Psalm 34, 18 says of him. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Aren't you glad that is our God? If you're in that place struggling to hold on to hope, can I just encourage you in the same way Jesus went out of his way to come alongside those two, he also pursues and walks with you, with you. But notice he doesn't just draw near, but he takes time to listen to their story. He takes time to listen to them. You know, I find it remarkable that Jesus, you know, I haven't got long left, just turns up and goes, ta-da, it's me, pull yourselves together, cheer up, let's get back to Jerusalem. He doesn't do that. I find that really interesting. In fact, we're told they are kept somehow from recognizing him. He allows them time to to process their disappointment. He allows them time to pour out their grief to him. Second key to waiting with hope. Don't ignore or belittle your disappointment and pain. But pour it out to Jesus. Pour it out to your your Father in heaven. Pour it out to God, the one who walks with us in our confusion, in our questions, in our doubts. Don't ignore it or belittle it. You know, so often the Christmas season in our culture can just be like, let's just hit pause for a moment on reality. Let's just forget about things. Let's just numb the pain. Let's just spend too much eat too much, drink too much, we'll sort it all out on January the 1st. I imagine there might be quite a lot of that this Christmas. Let's just blow it. We've had a rubbish year. Let's just ignore it. Anethanatize the, the pain. Anethanatize the, the frustration. God encourages us. Don't do that. Acknowledge it. Pour it out. Pour it out to him. Cast your cares on the one who cares for you. You know, like Cleopas and his friend, it's often our own expectations that cause us disappointment. God hasn't broken in in our time scale or in the way we want. You know, when, when we struggle to see how any good can possibly come from this, nothing makes sense. Where we cannot see where God is at work at all. And yet a massive part of this healing process is actually pouring out our frustration and taking it unfiltered to God. You know, the, the, the Psalms are so full of lament, expressing heartfelt disappointment to God. And yet, in doing that, we receive healing. Because the one who knows our hearts wants us to express our hearts to him and to allow him into our story so that we can enter into his story. You know, the whole of Christmas, as we've been singing about again this morning, is about Jesus entering into our darkness, entering into our story, becoming like us so that we can have access into his He enters into our pain and into our darkness so we can enter into his healing and into his light and into his hope and into his joy. That's the beautiful exchange that's right in the center of the Christmas story. And that's exactly what Jesus does. After they invite Jesus, albeit unknowingly, into their story, he now invites them into his. Let's pick this up from verse 25. He says to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Third key for waiting with hope, allow God's word to bring light into your darkness. Allow God's truth to bring hope into your hearts. You know, our Bible translations can come across a bit bluntly with this, you know, how foolish you are. I don't think Jesus' tone here uh, was, was harsh rebuke. I think it's, you know, from, from the time he spends with them, I think it's more like a parent to a child, oh, you silly thing, let me help you out here. Let me help you out here. And he unwraps the scriptures and shows how all of scripture ultimately points to Jesus. It all points to him. I mean, what must that have been like? a Bible study with Jesus. You know, seven miles, I don't know how long that takes. Two hours, two and a half hours, three hours, I don't know. That's quite a lovely amount of time just to go through, come and bring revelation, bring revelation. I wonder which bits he went to. Maybe he went right back to Genesis, Genesis 3.15, where the Savior is first promised, right at the point where sin comes into the world. Through man's disobedience, a savior is promised. God speaks to the serpent and says, the woman's offspring will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Just the sign of of the cross, just right there, right at the beginning. Did he talk about Exodus, where the Israelites were saved from slavery in Egypt by painting the doorposts with the blood of the lamb? Did he then go on to talk about all the Old Testament sacrificial systems? And how ultimately he would become the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Did he talk about Isaiah and this this new kingdom coming, but, but not ruled by an oppressive king, but by a servant king? And not just a servant king, a suffering servant. You know, maybe they could grasp the, the prophetic uh, messages about a, a victorious Messiah, but perhaps they didn't connect the suffering Messiah. Jesus was helping draw the dots. They're they're the one and the same. They're one and the same. Maybe he went to Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Maybe he went through some of the prophetic Psalms, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hold on, we've heard that somewhere before. I don't know. We don't know. Maybe he went through Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, talking about the the promised new covenant. I'm going to write my law on their hearts. It's going to be grace-based. It's going to be an inner change. We just don't know. But what an incredible time that must have been. Jesus was pouring truth after truth into our hearts, showing how this thread of salvation runs right the way through Scripture. That more than simply needing redemption from Roman rule, actually, he came to redeem the world from the rule of sin and death. He came to show that life comes through death, that hope comes through suffering. Later we're told their hearts were burning as Jesus was just pouring this truth into them. It was almost like Scripture was acting like like a defibrillator on their hearts, just pumping them back again with life and, and hope. If you feel like your heart's gone a bit dead, get stuck back into the Word of God. I really saw this defibrillator like a Bible on our chest, just pumping back in truth into our hearts again. Bringing that light and life. When we're struggling to hold on to hope, so often the last thing we reach for is the Bible. And yet that's exactly what we need to reach for when nothing else makes sense. We, when we can't see the wood for the trees, we need to immerse ourselves in truth and ask the Holy Spirit, to be our teacher. We don't have Jesus physically walking with us, but we have the counselor. We have the Holy Spirit walking with us, teaching us, shedding light on the truth, helping it 
to impact our hearts, just as Jesus did with these disheartened believers. Maybe this morning you are struggling to connect with God. Just encourage you, get into God's word, allow it to feed you, nourish you, strengthen you, replenish you. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring a fresh revelation of the hope that we have. And it's a wonderful hope. Rachel Newham has written a new book simply called And Yet. And she says this, When Jesus walks alongside us in our dark nights of the soul, he reminds us of his story, heaven's hope and death's despair, and he lets us know that hope has the last word. Jesus' resurrection proves hope has the last word word. And he places them into his story. You're part of this redemption plan. You're part of this redemption plan. Cleopas and his friends still haven't clocked who their travel companion is yet. The day is drawing on. Traveling at night is dangerous. And they invite Jesus to stay with them. Let's pick up the story, verse 28. As they approach their village, to which they were going. Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was with them at the table, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once back to Jerusalem. I I don't know if you notice, Jesus awaits an invitation. I don't know if he kind of feigned, I'm going to carry on walking, but God doesn't force his way into our lives. He awaits for an invitation. Revelation 3.20, here I am at the, at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And here again, we just see Jesus' personal relational touch here as he sits down to eat. Jesus wants that personal, intimate time with you. And he breaks bread with them. Last time he did that, it was at the Last Supper, just before his crucifixion. This time, it was nail-pierced hands that were breaking the bread. This time, his blood had already been shed for the forgiveness of sins. This time, it was retrospective. Job done. Sin, death, utterly defeated. And there he stands, pierced for our transgressions, resurrected in glory, victorious, and their eyes are finally opened. They realize who's in their house. And then he disappears. I mean, how frustrating must that be? They'll see him again if you read on, on this passage. But he opened the scriptures He opened their hearts, and then he finally opened their eyes to see who he truly is. You know, if you don't know Jesus, or if you're praying for someone to come into a relationship with Jesus, just pray, God, open their hearts to your word. Open their eyes to who you are. And what was the result of this revelation? They returned straight back to Jerusalem. They did a complete U-turn. Forget it's night. Forget it's dangerous. We've got to go back because revelation brings response. Fourth key in waiting with hope is knowing that God's plan has not changed. God's plan for your life has not changed. He is willing and acting in and through all our circumstances. They did a complete U-turn. Perhaps this morning, some of us need to do a complete U-turn. Perhaps in our disappointment and pain, we've just kind of done a bit of a detour. 
And maybe this morning, God wants to meet with you afresh by his spirit, remind you of the hope that you have in him, remind you of his finished work on the cross, remind you that there is redemption, that there is hope, and bring you back on track. Maybe you need to do a U-turn now. And what they do, which is beautiful, is they go straight back to their friends. I love the way Jesus redeems and restores people. We know that very same day, he also met with Peter, Simon Peter, personally, one-on-one. Peter, who thought he had blown it, denied Jesus. I've just, that's it. I've, I've completely blown it. Jesus makes a special visit to him, too, that very same day. Again, just showing his heart for the heartbroken. Later, he publicly recommissions him. But this is a private meeting. I love the way Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians 15, and it's referenced again in our passage. You know, we may think we've written ourselves out of the story, but Jesus invites us back in. I believe there's a word here for someone. You feel you've been written out of the story. Jesus is inviting you back in, back into fellowship with him, back into fellowship with other believers, back into the place where you can receive afresh from him. Back in a place where you can be a blessing to others. And that's the fifth key here for waiting in hope, is that he calls us to walk with others as well. And as I said, that's exactly what these guys did. They went back into Jerusalem and found their friends. Verse 33, they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon Peter. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. The Greek word for they told them is where we get our word exegesis. It literally means to unpack. And in the same way, Jesus unpacked the scriptures to them. So they now unpack the scriptures to their friends who are waiting, who are just as confused, just as, 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 as disappointed as they were, hiding behind locked doors still. They were able to bring that that encouragement to their friends. What Jesus had done to them, they were able to bring to their friends. They too needed a revelation of the gospel. That the, the resurrection means redemption. It means redemption of our inner person, our spirits, but ultimately it will mean the redemption of of the whole of creation, our bodies, praise God, one day, but also all of creation. This is the hope that we await. Romans 8.22 talks about the groaning of creation. Boy, do we see that at the moment. We always have, as if in labor planes, longing for freedom from its slavery of decay. We too, it says, it goes on, who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit, also inwardly grown as we long to experience our full status of God's sons and daughters, including the redemption of our physical bodies. Verse 24, for this is the hope of our salvation. But hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. We hope in what is still unseen, but we must trust and wait for it. Now, just as then, we need to invite Jesus into our waiting to tell him how we feel, unfiltered, raw, and allow him to speak truth into our lives. Allow his word to impact our our hearts as the Holy Spirit leads us. Allow our hearts to burn again inside us. Allow that that praise to start to well out. Allow that, that song of truth to come out of our mouths to others. And to remember that God's plan has never changed. Has never changed. I was at a small group, leaders gathering a few Weeks ago, it was a time of open sharing and then praying for one another. And one of the the guys there shared how they had tragically lost their son 
at the beginning of the first lockdown. And their son had been struggling for years. And there wasn't a, you, you know, you could hear a pin drop. And he just stood there and he just said, we are living proof that life comes through death, that hope comes through suffering. It was such a powerful time. And then one by one, others started to share what was going on in their lives. Not a dry eye in that circle, as people shared of of a God who meets us in the midst of our suffering and bringing life and bringing hope right in the midst of it. This Advent, who can you draw alongside? Who can you walk with and listen to as they pour their hearts out? Who can you gently guide to the one who doesn't just enter into our life, but invites us into his life of hope and light and ultimately redemption? One of my all-time favorite carols goes, The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. That is our hope, folks, that Jesus has done it on the cross. He died, he rose again, and he is returning in victory. And one day, all things will be made new. The thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. I just invite the band back. I'd love us just to pray while they're getting themselves together. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much that you entered into our darkness in weakness, in vulnerability, in obscurity. You left the splendor of heaven, light of the world, coming into our darkness. And I just thank you so much that you came to set us free. You came to bring us a hope that goes beyond the grave. You came to bring hope in the present and a hope in the future. We thank you that this hope is eternal. And I just pray for every single person here this morning and every single person listening online, may the light of life shine again in your hearts. May they know the one who draws alongside. Holy Spirit, right now, draw alongside those who are doubting, those who are weary, those who are frustrated. Bring your life and your hope. Allow them to enter into your story of victory and healing as you listen to them pouring out their hearts. Thank you that you are the comforter, Holy Spirit. You are the advocate and you are our guide, the one who leads us to Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are the light of the world. We just pray this Advent time, just bring people to our minds, those we can draw alongside, those who need to hear that message of hope and life and light. We pray this in your wondrous, mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Shall we worship him?